Fearless Fundraisers, I'm Dawn Lego, and it's that time again to buckle up for a new episode of Raise Nation, the one and only podcast made to inspire fundraisers like you to continue making impact in our communities, building better tomorrows and exchanging ideas. So whether you're a trailblazer or seasoned pro, you'll pick up the trends that transform your fundraising. And together, we'll dive into lively conversations and chat with industry-leading fundraisers and thought leaders to explore those hot-button issues and innovative ideas. So stay with us for the next 30 minutes while we explore you, while we explore and help you embrace the future of fundraising. I can't wait to get going. I am so pleased to welcome my guest today and dive into some really great fundraising discussions. Um, please welcome to the Raise Nation Radio, and I'm going to hopefully not butcher his name, but Mr. Joe Berninger, is that right? Joe, hi, how are you? You got it. Uh, great, Don. Great to yay. be here today. Perfect. Well, we're so glad to have you. Uh, why don't we just start with a great introduction? Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about yourself, um, your organization, and you know what your mission, what, what you do to impact our communities. So take it away, Joe. Okay, great. Thanks, Don. So I'm Joe Berninger. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I've got two teenage boys and a little girl, 11-year-old girl at home. Uh, and I am executive director and founder of Cooperative for Education. And our mission is to break the cycle of poverty in Guatemala, Central America, through education. Um, I grew up in a, in a family of teachers. So uh, my, my, my dad was a, the local science teacher. My mom was the local history teacher. And I grew up uh, going to school with mom and dad. So we come from an education family, and that was drilled in early. You know, the power of education to get people up to a whole new level in their lives. Yeah, education. It is it is the basics of everything, right? I uh, remember as my kids were little. Um, I you know for in our family, um, some of us went to college, some of us didn't. But my children grew up thinking that it wasn't an option, right? You kind of had to. Um, do everything and anything that you could to educate yourself so that you could um, move on in life and, and capture your dreams. So what's going on in Guatemala? Why is there such a need to tell us that backstory? So Guatemala, and a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of Guatemala is an island of illiteracy right here in our hemisphere. So uh, Guatemala, it still t in, it, in this uh, day, one out of three people can't read. So it's hard to believe <sighs> that 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 close to home, we have that level of illiteracy in, in the country. So all the countries around Guatemala have progressed, but Guatemala remains way behind in literacy. So we've uh, been working for 25 years uh, going to Guatemala, and uh, we have a, a three-pronged focus. So we help kids learn to read. We help teach them basic technical skills that they need to get jobs, and we help them graduate from high school. So I, I call them the, the three magic tickets out of poverty. Literacy, technical skills, graduation from high school. And we work to try to give kids there all three so they have those opportunities. We, we, we want kids that are in school today not to drop out of school and become one of those illiterate adults. All right, we got to change those numbers because if, if my math is right, and um, math's not my strong suit, but one out of three, that's um, 33%. Yep, it's a lot of people. And I remember the first time I went to Guatemala and I was uh, j just, I, I was traveling and I never really knew what illiteracy looked like, right? We come from a country where we have better than 90% literacy. And I was riding on a bus, I was lost and I got my map out and I asked a woman, you know, hey, could you help me figure out how to get to the next town? I, I held up the map and she just backed away from me. Um, so it, it wasn't that she didn't want to help me, she just couldn't read it. And also, when you deal with documentation in Guatemala, you want to have somebody when I would give uh, money for a kid to have a scholarship, for example, and the parents had to, to sign the papers to get the scholarship, they would sign with a thumbprint. So they couldn't even write their own name. This, the thumbprint is that universal symbol of illiteracy, and you see it all over Guatemala. Wow. You know, you're really striking a chord with me. Um, I, my husband and I are raising a son with special needs, and um, anytime time. I advocate for him that that's top of my mind. You know, we have to do everything and anything that to make sure that my son can read that that's super, super, super important to me yeah, because I feel once you can read everything. Yeah. You, 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 you just could, um, 
uh, from everything from learning to entertainment to communicating, you know, reading really is the foundation uh, of everything. So um, changing those numbers in Guatemala, I, I could understand why you have that mission. So how did it all get started? I mean, I'm just so intrigued by that. Um, give me, give me that story. I want to hear all the stories. How did it all get started? 25 years. It's a long time. It's a long time. And, um, I was the young guy starting a project back then, and now I'm the old guy. So that was back before any gray hair. Okay, and, we're on. Vi- although most of our listener, most of the people <laughs> are tuning in by audio only, you know, on our podcast. I have the pleasure of seeing you right now. I wouldn't call you the old guy, but go ahead with that. So uh, the story goes back to the '60s, and I had an uncle that was a missionary in Guatemala. So that that was kind of our toehold. And when uh-huh. I graduated from college, my younger brother and I were always looking for someplace warm to go in the winter. So we would go down to visit Uncle Dave in Guatemala. Uncle Dave in Guatemala. OK. And he, he exposed us to the country and we got to and helped to, helped us learn Spanish. Uh, connected us to to the people there, the culture, and we basically fell in love with the place. Um, My younger brother then uh, got a job as a teacher at a school there. So this is uh, about 27 years ago, and they gave him a job teaching English. And he thought, you know, I can teach English at this school, no problem. It's my native language. And he said, "I'll, I'll just stay a chapter ahead of the kids in the book. And so he he goes in on his first day and he says, "Okay, I'll just find the books and we'll just kind of lead through that. and It'll be just fine. He walked into the classroom and he said, I saw 40 sets of brown eyes looking back at me. And I said, donde esta los libros? Where where are the books? And he said, I just it was just silence. The kids didn't respond. He said, maybe my Spanish isn't good enough. Let me try this again. Donde están los libros? And he still got silence. Um, finally, a kid in the back put his hand up and said, uh, Senor, there are no books here. No, I libros I keep. And he said, oh, OK, you know, no books in the class. OK, well, it's the English class, of course. Maybe they don't have English books. But he learned that there were no books in the English class, no books in any of the other classes, no books in the whole country. Um, oh, my god! 95 percent of schools have no books of any kind. So the project got started basically as an effort to bring books to schools. And uh, so he would, my brother was the co-founder. He called me up, said, Joe, it's time for us to start a nonprofit, get the family involved, and let's put books into these schools. And it just kind of grew from there. So it started as a book provision project. Well, you, if you pro- provide books, the teachers need to learn how to use them. So books, if it goes from books only to books plus intensive training. So a lot of what Cooperative for Education does today is we train uh, about a thousand teachers a year, and we certify teachers. Oh, make, make I'm them, sorry, make a, them thousand? A, about a thousand, a thousand teachers a year. Wow. With the idea okay. of making them master teachers, master educators. Okay. And so, wow. kind of the the magic formula for teaching kids to read is, is pretty simple. You put a really good library of books in the classroom and it has to be in the classroom. If you put if you put books in a school library, you'll come back a year later and they'll still be in the shrink wrap. If you put the books in the classroom, the kids will will read them and the teachers will use them. So 150 books, at least in the classroom, plus a two year training program for the teacher. We call it the magic literacy formula. And you get kids advancing towards literacy at twice the rate as kids that don't have it. And so what that translates into is so instead of a kid waiting till third grade or fourth grade to learn to read, which is very typical in Guatemala, they're already reading by first and second grade. And we, we have teachers sometimes that say, this will never work. We've never seen a kid in our school learn to read in first grade. And they'll do the project for a year and they'll start to see at the end of the year, their better students will already be reading at the end of first grade. So you're changing the narrative for sure. That's amazing. It, it definitely changes the narrative. And uh, we're, we're excited about it because what, what happens when you train a teacher is uh, they're, they're not only educating the kids that are in their classroom this year, but they get a fresh crop of kids next year. And then the year after that, they get another fresh crop. Year after that, another fresh crop. Year after that, another fresh crop. We've calculated that it, even if we stop today training teachers, uh, we, bef- but, and, and we took the, the, the thousand or fifteen hundred certified teachers that we have today, our army of certified teachers. Uh, 
they will go on before they retire and educate 2.1 million students and help them learn to read. So but you're not going to stop today, right? You're not going to stop training teachers today. Is that right? Yeah, we hope not to. We hope not to. So that, that's the goal. But there's a huge long-term effect by training a teacher. It's, it's the gift that keeps given every year. The ripple effect keeps keeps on going. That's beautiful. So what does cooperative for education look like today? You know, you started with your your brother and yourself and let's form a nonprofit. What what do you look like today? How many, you know, volunteers, people? What does it look like? So we, we've been been very blessed with a, a lot of wonderful people that have come to uh, uh, join the cause and become part of the team. Um, we named it the cooperative, cooperative for education, because it was based on that concept that um, that our power, we believe that our power as humans is our collective power. It's working together that and combining our time, our talent, our treasure, that we can really move mountains in the world. So we're now a team of, of about 3,000 donors uh, that contribute financially to the project. Um, we're a staff of 12 in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we are a staff of... Uh, 48 teachers, trainers, social workers in Guatemala. So you've come a long way from your brother calling you up and saying, hey, we need to start a 501c3, huh? Yep, we come a long way. As we say in Guatemala, it's it's, uh, poco a poco, little by little. Every year, you know, a little bit more, a little bit bigger, a little bit better. Poco poco by poco, is that right? Yeah, poco a poco. Poco a poco. Little by little. And it, just, yeah. and, and it just builds. And we're, we're really big on continual improvement and all of that. So we've had the benefit now of 25 years of Poco a Poco. Poco a Poco. I love that. Little by little. Well, same thing with you can say with fundraising, right? Little by little. Um, I would imagine that it, it, it takes, um, you know, you have a lot of wonderful things going for you. You know, people, you have passion, commitment, a mission, uh, um, stories, a purpose. It feels like you have all the ingredients, but we all know to keep programming alive to the magnitude that you're doing, it also takes uh, fundraising. So what is your what is your 365 fundraising look like and how do you get there every year? So uh, for fundraising, it's always, you know, for, for every nonprofit, it's the big challenge. You know, you it's, it's what keeps you up at night. It's also what, what gets you out of bed in the morning. You know, the, the need to get up and continue. Oh, let's that. stop right there. All you fearless <laughs> fundraisers, right? We know it keeps you up at night, but it does get you out of bed in the morning. I love that, Joe. That was classic. Thank you. Um, OK, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but go ahead. And, you know, it's. What what I love, I'm just very thankful for having for having the opportunity in life to work for a cause. OK, I think I think it is even if some days I do want to pull my hair out overall, I really enjoy what I do. I enjoy uh, being able to be part of a work that makes a difference. Um, so I see fundraising as sharing that opportunity with other people. So I love it. I get up every day and, and I do enjoy what I do. I look forward to coming into the office. I look forward to what I do. Um, and so for me, if I make a if I call someone and, and, and invite them to participate in that, I'm basically inviting them to be part of my joy and, and to give them an opportunity to do something that's going to make them happy too, give them purpose, give them a sense of meaning. Um, so we try to do, we try to offer those opportunities in as many different ways as we have potential supporters. Um, I, I believe that diversity is good. You want to, you never want to get your funds from any one type of source, any one age group, any one, uh, campaign. So if you like hands-on, if you want to swing a hammer and, and use a paintbrush, we have ways to get you to Guatemala to fix up schools. Um, if you like events, uh, we do events each year. Um, and what one cost just supported our big fall fiesta uh, online event. Uh, with the pandemic, we are experimenting with online events. We've never done that before. So with uh, with th- this the platform and so forth, we were able to go from an in-person event of 300 to an online event of 1,300. Whoa, 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 whoa. In-person event of 300 to an online event of 1300. That yeah. sounds like you moved in the right direction. 
yeah, we totally moved in the right direction. You know, the in-person events, everybody in Cincinnati, right? But the cause has gotten much bigger than Cincinnati. And the online event and the ability to bid online and transact online has connected us to our broader base of supporters all over the United States and Canada and in Guatemala. We had 50 people from Guatemala that participated in the event, and we've never been able to do that before. Wow, broaden your reach. You know, we, we've heard a theme for sure in the last you know couple of people that have um, joined us on Raise Nation Radio that the pandemic rough, was rough, right? There's no doubt you had to get creative, think out of the box, do things differently. But there might be some silver linings. And when, when I hear that you've broadened your reach and you've moved from, you know, engaging 300 at an in-person event to 1300 and also hit home, you know, where, where your mission is. Um, lives and breathes, that's really a good thing. And hopefully those are lessons learned and things that we can take into the future to support the mission and to support fundraising and maybe do things complementary and a little bit different that that will help us maybe grow in ways that we hadn't thought about before. Fair? Is that a fair yeah, statement? Yeah, fair, fair. Um, I think in our case as a charity, we've advanced five years in one year. Wow. Because of the pandemic, because we've been forced, as you're saying, like we, we, we've been forced to have to adapt to the fact that we can't get everybody together for an event um, in Guatemala. You know, we work in schools and education. So how do you educate kids? How do you how do you get kids reading when your program when they can't come to school? So you're in a third world country. They can't come to school. They don't have Internet most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do we keep our kids from losing a year? And so yeah, we've had I mean, to become innovative. We've had to we've had to think of ways to do that, and and we did. We did figure. How that did out. you do that? I want to hear. Tell me how you did that. Well, we had, uh, as I mentioned before, we had, we have these beautiful 150 copy uh, libraries in the classrooms. Okay, but if the schools close, the kids don't get access to that. So we took 15,000 books by t- we broke down all these in class libraries, 15,000 books, and distributed them to the kids at home. And then set up a scheme whereby they're rotated every two weeks. So a kid gets five books and the next week it's a different five, a different five and a different five. So instead of the kid coming to the library and checking out a book, the library came to the kid. Essentially, He brought the library to the home. Uh, So that was one strategy. And then we complemented that with another strategy of uh, we realized that uh, a, a children's book, a good children's book in Guatemala costs you about ten dollars. OK, ten dollars to buy it. If you print them like a newspaper, the same content, the same story, print it like a newspaper, it costs you 10 cents. So it's 100 times cheaper if you don't bind it and don't have it in the form of a book. So we produced 22,000 newspaper books and distributed them for free to the kids again in their homes so that they were reading a book like a newspaper, but it was the same content. And we kept them reading because reading, especially in the early grades, is all about practice. Every, every day, the kid needs to be reading at least 20 minutes. And we were able to accomplish that through then the newspaper books, in addition to the uh, distributed library books. Well, I love that um, because uh, I know here in, in, in my family, in my communities, we were quarantined and we were certainly looking for things to do. There's only so much television and electronics that you can play with. So by bringing the library right into the home, you were also offering somewhat of a distraction for those very long days of quarantining, right? It was something to do and something to do that was productive and educational. So um, probably helped on, on a number of levels. So I think that's a beautiful story. Um, in a way, the literature and the books are able to are, are a connector for the kids because yeah. they are home and they're not connecting with each other. They're not connecting with other adults or other children. And the books can connect them at least mentally to other places and other times and all of that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You have such great stories. And we know that the key of fundraising is storytelling. You certainly have racked them in. I mean, I've just loved some of the things that you've said. I've, I've actually written them down. You know, um, I think one of the most beautiful things you said is that when you're reaching out to your donors and you mentioned that you have about three thousand of that, you know, um, regular donors um, that you're not really so much saying, hey, donate, give, do, you're, you're really saying, hey, walk with me. Um, 
you know, share the joy, share the pleasure, learn um, about the mission and, and the messaging and the impact. And you're just asking somebody to walk alongside you in the joy of, of what you're doing there. And it's just a different mindset, I think, um, and, and takes fundraising to a completely different perspective. And I love that. Has that been um, a, a successful uh, methodology or approach for you rather than having the here's a donate button, click, give what you can, you know, kind of thing. Is that been an approach? It's worked for us. Yeah. And and we've grown. So we, we grew from uh, $3,000 a year budget to now we're at 3 million and in, in money raised and, and invested a year. And uh, we we're very careful to bring in other people onto our team that have the same mindset I do. So we're, we're, we, we, we are a relentlessly positive culture. Um, we're, we're optimists. We, we believe that you can make a difference in the world, uh, that, that, that the problems are not that great, that poverty is not intractable, and you can help get people out of poverty. That uh, getting people out of poverty is not hard, it's actually easy if you do the right things. And so we bring that optimism to it. Um, and I think it's, it's worked well for us to, if, if you're gen, we, I feel I'm genuinely excited about what I do. And I am, if I genuinely believe in what I do and I do, and I, and I, and we've had enough time now to see that it works and see the transformational stories of lots and lots of kids in Guatemala that all I have to do is talk about what I'm excited about. And that's an invitation for people to walk with me and with us. And that has worked very well. It's made it, it makes it so much less transactional and much more of a journey. And I think it's very refreshing and, and to our fearless fundraisers out there listening, you know, that, that messaging um, about, share our joy, um, take it from Joe and, you know, just walk alongside us and make it a journey, not so much a, you know, a, a transaction. Um, bravo. I think you're, I think you're doing great, Joe. That's, it's just nice. The other thing that I heard was try a little bit of everything, be very diverse, um, and very hands-on, you know, walk the walk, talk the talk. And so, um, it's nice to, uh, see that you're, you know, dabbling here, there, and everywhere, leveraging the pandef pandemic to uh, drive new things. And I'm so glad to hear that you feel like you've grown five years in, in the one year. But tell me about your fall festival. I want to hear about that because I did get a glimpse of it. Um, and uh, I want to hear some of the things that you did there. Yes. Yeah, so, so fall fiesta, we, we've uh, been doing it now every year for 24 years. So we started wow. the year after we started. So some we, history. Had, we had the 24th one. And uh, it's been a lot of fun and really interesting to uh, just uh, deal with the challenge of how do we reach out? And, you know, we've got we've been blessed with this wonderful base of supporters now and they're and they're far beyond Cincinnati, Ohio. So how do we now use electronic media to connect them to the work? Um, so it, before, as I said before, we got 300 in Cincinnati. But how can we reach out and get everybody in the United States? We got a bit, an emerging base in Canada now. Mm. Uh, what I love about online is it just completely erases international boundaries. Uh, we've got a big pocket of supporters in Great Britain that have discovered us and the word kind of spreads around. So I had to, I had to get up at four in the morning about two weeks ago to do a presentation over in London by Zoom. But it was, it was great because I worth it. <laughs> it, it was worth it. Um, and so suddenly we're able to um, we put out a, an, an email to our base and said, we will do presentations at any Rotary Club or church or any group that you're there you're with that needs a speaker because we're, we're all on Zoom now. Right. And we run out of content really easily. We, we got three hundred and twenty requests. Whoa. And so somebody from my staff is presenting pretty much somewhere every day and we're presenting all over the world. Yeah, there's only 365 days. Yeah, there's 365 days a year. So you're off like what? The math's right. Uh, 30 something days um, yeah. with 320 requests. Uh, 45. Yeah. There we go. I can give me a second. I could do math a little bit better. So that's amazing. 
Yeah. So it's the power of volunteers, you know, so we're not doing them all, but we've recruited, we call them our ambassadors. So it's another way volunteers have been able to get involved, to be trained as ambassadors, to be presenters. And, you know, two years ago, no one was interested in a Zoom presentation. Okay. So if, if they're gathered in person, they don't want somebody on a screen speaking to them. They wanted somebody in person. It just was the mindset pre pandemic. Now coming out of the pandemic, everybody's very comfortable with that technology. And very often I'm the guy on the screen speaking to a live audience, but I'm in a different city. And so it's really opened up, I think, a lot of opportunities for charities to get their word out about what they do, that people are now okay with doing Zoom and giving you an opportunity to address them. And you don't have to, you don't have to fly to Los Angeles, you don't have to fly to Dallas, you don't have to fly to Toronto. You 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 click the link and you're presenting in front of a live audience. And so that, that's been transformational for us the last, the last year and a half. And I don't think it has any um, generational boundaries anymore. I know with my own parents, um, you know, they would never pre pre pandemic um, hit zoom or FaceTime, you know, but once they caught wind of the fact that they were quarantined and they couldn't see their grandchildren, they real quickly learn. Like, mom, dad, if you're listening, I love you. But, you know, technology hasn't really been, you know, your thing. But they learned very quickly how to FaceTime, how to open up pictures on their um, their phone and uh, how to Zoom because that was the only option. So I think we've um, kind of bridge that generation gap too, right? People are just comfortable clicking on that Zoom and and it doesn't really have the expense of flights and hotels and, and all that stuff to be in person. So it's great to see that you've capitalized on that. Yeah, I think it's a whole new world now post pandemic that we're moving into that it's it'll never go back to the way it was. It'll be a hybrid yeah. world where, where both are acceptable, where, you, where, where most events are either you're in person or you're you're there virtually, but you have you open up to a whole new world of participation. So there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of um, I don't want to say controversy. What's the word that I'm looking for? You know, the debate, right? There's a lot of debate. Like moving forward, what do you think? Do you think this is a temporary um, response to the pandemic and post maybe pandemic, and then in the future we're going to slowly go back to the old ways, or do you think that this is forever changed and hybrid or combination is is here to stay what what, what what's your thoughts on that um i i think uh, i hope we don't go all the way back um I, I think hybrid is here to stay and i think uh clearly it will be because uh i, I see our, our own organization changing okay so we we went from uh even in our own offices uh five days full time 40 hours a week in the office uh, to to hybrid. So we're, we're, we have three core team days on Mondays and Fridays. Everybody's welcome to work at home. Um, I would have never been okay with that three years ago. It was just not on the radar screen. I thought, well, for a team, we have to have teamwork, right? We have to be together. But I think we've all been forced to try having teamwork using electronic media, Zoom and Skype and all the rest. And we see it works actually pretty well. And that, and that suddenly there's a lot of efficiencies. You know, you don't have to drive half an hour to work. You don't have to deal with traffic. You don't deal with parking. And it may be, and it suddenly for really busy people puts an hour and a half back in their day because they're not doing those things. And that hour and a half can be used to make them more, have a, more, a richer personal life or even to have more work time, however you choose to use it. But um I hear and see it among my colleagues and our companies here in Cincinnati. Uh, very few are going back to the way it was. People like the the flexibility. So I, I think we're, we're, we're hybrid, whether we like it or not, going forward. And I think it's for the better. I do, too. I, I have to agree with you. And uh, it's good that we've learned some of those lessons because maybe we can fundraise smarter and better and keep programming, you know, at, at, a, at an all time high. I can't believe we've just spoken for um, over 25 minutes and there's so much more that I want to ask you. So we might have to have you back for another episode. But I do want to make sure that we get in a, a little something about your children. You said you have two boys, right? And one girl. Is that right? Yep, I do. And what? So what do they think about this? Right. Uh, I would assume that they are 
reading and value reading and, you know, are getting a, a, an education, but I'm sh- sure being that they're your children, that they're very aware of the struggles and challenges in Guatemala. So um, are you cultivating the next uh, generation or um, from a, you know, a, a, another generation mindset, wh- where are they in this um, whole mission of cooperative for education? That's a great question. Um, so my goal is, is, young as they could be involved, it was to get them involved in the work that we're doing in Guatemala. So I've taken uh, at least my, my two older boys, my daughter's still a little on the young side, uh, to Guatemala with me several times to help uh, rehab schools and participate in our literacy projects. Um, they are teenagers now. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not always cool to have dad up in your business, you know, trying to make sure that you also are building your life around service and all that kind of thing. Um, so they, uh, they're, they're very involved, very interested. And whenever they get a chance to give a presentation about themselves, to introduce themselves to a group that they're joining or to speak in class, they almost always use their Guatemala experiences, um, to talk about what kind of defines them and what they value. Um, I have a son that my oldest son is uh, applying to colleges this year and his college essays are all about service that he's learned to do in Guatemala and through the work with us. That's beautiful. At the end, they do it. They don't always have a great attitude. I get the teenager thing, but, uh, but yeah, we all do. I have two myself. (laughs) I have two teenagers. So very good. Yeah. My daughter just, um, uh, became a freshman in, in college and, um, similar to, to your children, she definitely leveraged some of her service work in her college essays. So if we have any parents that are listening, um, probably a good thing to leverage if you're embarking on that whole college journey, um, those stories work in fundraising, but they also work on college essays for sure. So definitely do. Yeah, um, my well, kids have always had an opportunity, have also had an opportunity to meet some of the kids in Guatemala years ago that we were supporting and get to see over the years how those kids progress due, due to, the, to, to the help. And so it's been really fun. Uh, we've adopted families in Guatemala and, you know, kids that were getting ready to drop out of school after second or third grade um, now have grown up, gone on to junior high, gone on to high school, graduated from college, and now have their own families. So it's been fun for my family and I to watch other families progress. And again, it reinforces my belief that we, we can help. It, it is possible to make the world better. Um, if we invest wisely in education, we can change people's life, f- lives for permanently and, and, and for the better. And it doesn't cost that much. Um, and it's just so easy to think that that problem is intractable and it's not. Uh, we, we, we can change lives and we can change the world. And it's been fun. Um, one of the benefits of having done the same thing for 25 years is you get to see that long-term change. You get to see ba- babies you held on your lap now grown up and having their own babies. Aww. And the baby that was you held on your lap 25 years ago was born deep into poverty with illiterate parents, very little future. And now in the next generation, they're having kids that will never need scholarships and never need help from us because mom and dad are middle class and they can afford all that themselves. So you see that cycle of poverty broken through education. And that's been a real inspiration for me and for my kids, my family. So you're living the mission for sure, personally and professionally. Trying to. Yeah. As as imperfectly as we we all do. But yeah. Bravo. Yeah, bravo. This has been very special for me to hear your story. So um, before we we wrap up, two more questions. You know, I'm so inspired and I'm sure our listeners are inspired as well. How would somebody get involved? You know, I I love what you said earlier that you have diverse opportunities and you're, you're able to accept help however people want to help, whether it's volunteering or donating or just sharing your joy. So how would people get involved um, if they're as inspired as I am today? So it's really easy. Uh, just join the, just go to our website and join the family. So we have, uh, join the family. you can just click jo- join our, our, our emailing list and, or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. And we, we, 
we're the cooperative and we consider anybody who has interest in the work, who follows us or who donates to be part of the family. Uh, and so we invite you to join our family of supporters. We would love to have you become part of this great work. And it's just what what let's let's get let's give our listeners the full web address. Is it I mean, I guess I could just Google cooperative for education. Yeah. Yep. If you Google cooperative for education, it'll come up, but it's uh, it, it's C-O-E-D-U-C dot O-R-G. OK, one more time on that. C-O-E-D-U-C dot O-R-G. Okay, perfect. I think we got it that time. All right. Cooperative for Education. My last question then, um, before we wrap up, any shout outs, any special sponsors out there or donors, or of course, we probably want to shout out to all of the parents and teachers and caregivers in in Guatemala that have embraced, you know, this change. Um, But who do you want to shout out? I'll leave that more to you. So definitely a shout out to uh, to one cause and the ability to uh, to make online giving work and make it make that a fun and positive experience for people that are you know bidding on items or uh, wanting to support kids or working together to all chip in money to make make possible for one kid to go to school you know you need a platform that pulls all that together and make that work and we've been really really happy with uh, with one cause so shout out there I want to shout out to all of our all of our great staff. Um, I I often say that the the best part of working a nonprofit is not the money because you don't make that much, but it's for, it's because of the people you get to go through life with. So in the crazy roller coaster of life, the people on your coaster are people that have a heart of gold, uh, share a common sense of meaning for wanting to make the world better. They, they tend to be amazing people and you get to work with those people and you get to have those people as your supporters. And that's worth everything. So to all of our supporters and to all of our staff, both here in Guatemala, I give a huge shout out to all of you for a, a fantastic job. Well, I'll give a big shout out to you, Joe. Um, it's very inspiring talking to you. And um, I know I'm going to be checking it out. Um, reading is just such a major part of my family's life. And um, it'd be nice if we could just completely eradicate that, you know, one out of every three. Um, so I want to wish you all the best of luck. And uh, to all our fearless fundraisers out there, I'm so sorry, but that's about all the time we have for today. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's Raise Nation topic and your daily dose of fundraising inspiration. Tune in for new episode releases every Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But in the meantime, be sure to listen to all the episodes on Raise Nation Radio and follow the channel so that you can get notifications about all our new guests, just like Joe. Fundraisers are doing amazing things to build better tomorrows for our communities, as you just heard with Cooperative for Education. Their stories are awe-inspiring. You won't want to miss a single episode. I would like to thank our sponsor, One Cause, for making this episode possible. One Cause is driving the future of fundraising with easy-to-use software solutions that help nonprofits connect with their donors. Be sure to check them out on onecause.com and visit the resource tabs on their homepage for a broad catalog of content and eBooks that I'm sure you'll find helpful. A huge shout out to Joe from Cooperative um, for Education um, as my guest today and for sharing his expert and authentic voice. I, I've never heard so many one-liners in, in one episode. Um, so Joe, thank you for that. I really, really enjoyed our time together. Thanks for uh, being here on Raise Nation Radio. Any last words of inspiration? Uh, thank you, Don. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to be with your listeners. So uh, this has just been just absolutely fantastic. So well, we enjoyed I, I, having you. I and mean, everybody out there, just go put 100% in every day. It, it, it's worth it. You're, you're changing the world. You're making the world a better place. Thank, thank you for what you do. Well, Joe, thank you again so much. And that is a wrap. Until next time, I'm Don Lego, and this is Raise Nation Radio. Stay fearless out there. One Cause is the proud sponsor of Raise Nation Radio and your daily dose of fundraising inspiration. One Cause is driving the future of fundraising with easy to use software solutions that help nonprofits connect with donors. Day in and day out, One Cause puts your cause at the center of everything they do. Let One Cause power your fundraising.